continues on with school. But all the while, he knows he's the Messiah. He goes into his father's shop, and he's building what they built back in the day. And all the time, he's thinking, what am I going to say? So Jesus, by the time he gets to the Sermon on the Mount, he's worked a few miracles. People know there's a young preacher here in town, and that he heals the sick. And now he's got a great gathering by the seaside on the mountain. So he goes up to the top of the mountain, and everybody must be hanging on his words. And the first thing he says is, happy are the unhappy. Everybody must have been, what? What did he just say? But Jesus coming now is outlining the people who are now in his kingdom. He's using language that's going to distinguish him from anybody else, from the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And when you're poor in spirit, you know that something's wrong with you, and that the only one who can fix it is Jesus. You might not even know who can fix it, but you know that there's a deficiency there. When you know that and realize it and know that there's nothing you can do, you're on your way to heaven. From there, you go on to happier those who mourn. Because when you have that heart sorrow for the sins that you have committed against Jesus, you feel sorrowful. But Jesus, in your repentance, will accept you and forgive you and comfort you. Then we will display meekness, because that is also a characteristic of Jesus. And the more that we come to him, the more we will become like him. Till we get to the point that we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And with that... Jesus will fill us with his righteousness. Now, since we got through the first uh, four, I can continue on with uh, the second part. Blessed are the merciful. The word mercy appears 261 times in the Bible. When a word appears that many times, one can say that it is at least of some importance if it is used that many times. Mercy is something that is attributed to God. It is something that he is known for. It is also something that when we have it, it will testify that we have a connection with God. Mercy is the heart of true religion. Oh, Norman, could you pass out the, the sheets there? All right, there's a lot of scripture, so I'm just going to go through it so we're not here all day. In Proverbs 14.31, it says, He that oppresses the poor reproaches his maker. But he that honoreth him has mercy on the poor. Right here, Solomon tells us that mercy honors our Maker, our Creator, our King, and our Brother, Jesus Christ. On the mountainside, Jesus, who spoke the words through Solomon to say those words, is now echoing those same words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The heart of man is by nature cold, dark, and unloving. Whenever one manifests the spirit of mercy and forgiveness, he does not do it of himself, through the influence of the Divine Spirit upon his heart. We love because he first loved us. God is the source of all mercy. It is from him where all mercy stems from. He is the originator of mercy. In Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, and that will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. When Jesus comes to Moses on Mount Sinai to rewrite the commandments after he broke the first set, our Lord comes down in the cloud to proclaim the name of the Lord, and the first characteristic out of the mouth of God is mercy. God is merciful. How are we as Christians to be merciful? The merciful are those who manifest compassion to the poor, the suffering, and the oppressed. Let us look at a few texts that talk about mercy. In Psalms 146, verses 9, it says, The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow. In Isaiah 1, verses 17, it says, Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. The word here used for judge is shafat, which also means to vindicate. So vindicating the, the fatherless is a merciful act, in line with the rest of the verse. 
Now, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 6, it says, If you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. This is the portion of the verse that we're going to be looking at. If you begin to read from the beginning of the chapter, you'll see that God is telling the children of Israel to turn back to him, and showing mercy is a sign that you are turned towards God. Basically, what God is telling them and us is that we need to show the same mercy that God shows to us, to others. In Jeremiah 22, verses 3, he says, The Lord, thus saith the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the, the widow. Sorry. Neither shed innocent blood in his place. God reiterates the message for us to have mercy, to show mercy to others like I show mercy. Okay, now let's look at James chapter 1, verses 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, to keep himself unspotted from the world. That verse sums up the last half of the Beatitudes right there. James marries the concept of mercy and obedience to God right there in pure religion. Being unspotted from the world is obedience to God. And mercy is of high value to God, seeing that it is one of his character traits, and it shows that we are connected to God because we display his character. The merciful are partakers of divine nature, and in them the compassionate love of God finds expression. All whose hearts are in sympathy with the heart of infinite love will seek to reclaim, not to condemn. Christ dwelling in the soul is a spring that never runs dry. Where he abides, there will be an overflowing of love. To appeal to the erring, the tempted, the wretched victims of want and sin, the Christian does not ask, are they worthy? But how can I benefit them? In the most wretched, the most debased, he sees souls whom Christ has died to save, and for whom God has given to his children the ministry of reconciliation. Job says, I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My judgment was a, as a robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. The merciful shall obtain mercy. The soul of blessing shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. And that's Proverbs 25. There is the sweet peace for the compassionate spirit, the blessed satisfaction in the life of self-forgetful service for the good of others. The Holy Spirit that abides in the soul and is manifest in the life will soften the hard hearts and awaken sympathy and tenderness. You will reap what you sow. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus uses the Beatitudes to tell the world of the people who inhabit his spiritual kingdom. And after he identifies all who are in his kingdom, he goes on to say that he is upholding the law and to complete it, to fill it up, so to speak, to show what measure we are to keep it. The word here for fulfill is pleros, which means to fill up. Jesus didn't come to void the law, but to live up to it by showing the measure by which it was meant to be kept. And as we see later, Christ goes on to expand the law beyond the mere letter of it. Let's take a look at what Jesus says in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5, because this is in contrast to the people in his kingdom. He says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when the people have heard this, their heads must have exploded. They must have been reeling. Right? Can you imagine the astonishment that that statement would have brought? Right? Because they revered the scribes and the Pharisees and looked to them as their example. These words were nothing short of revolutionary. Now why did Jesus use them as a contrast to the people in his kingdom? Because, the character of the, because of the character of the scribes and the Pharisees. In numerous places in the gospel, the Pharisees were seeking to accuse Jesus, to hinder his work, and eventually plotted to kill him. This is exactly the opposite 
of what it means to have a pure heart. And also, the opposite character to the rest of the Beatitudes as well. When you look further on in the chapter, you see that it isn't just the actions that Jesus is worried about. It's the intents, the thoughts, what is on the inside of a man. The thing that you don't have a hope of changing yourself. You can only control your temper, but you can't rid yourself of it. Only God can do that. The Pharisees kept the appearance of the law outwardly, but their hearts were far from the truth. Because of their, imp because of their impure hearts, their very tradition struck down the law of God when it suited them. When Jesus quoted Isaiah when speaking to the Pharisees about them using their tradition to nullify God, being, sorry, he spoke about it when they were using their tradition to nullify his law. Being pure is a, a quality that is attributed to God. In Job 4.17, it says, Shall a mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Job acknowledges that God is pure and more pure than man. The psalmist also attributes purity to God as well in Psalms 12.6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You might be saying, wait a second, that word says, his, verse says his words are pure, not God. However, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if God's words are pure, then his heart is pure. David also goes on to say that the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. David further expands purity in telling you what a pure heart will get you. In Psalms 24, verses 4 and 5, he says, He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of salvation. Solomon goes on to say, Proverbs 30, verses 5, Every word of God is pure. Not just some, but every word. Now Peter also talks about purity. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So Peter right there ties purity to obedience to the truth. Through the Spirit, and this is consistent with John 16, 13, the description of what the Spirit of truth does. And the seed of that pure heart is the Word of God. John the Revelator records the words of Jesus in John 17, 17, that says, Sanctify them through thy truth, and thy word is truth. Sanctify and purify are synonymous. The Spirit sanctifies and purifies, and it is done through obedience to God's law through the Spirit. As the Spirit of truth leads you into truth and purifies you, he is making you a citizen of Christ's kingdom. When Christ shall come in his glory, the wicked cannot endure to behold him. The light of his presence, which is, which is life to those who love him, is death to the ungodly. The expectation of his coming to them is a fearful looking for judgment and a fiery indignation. When he shall appear, they will pray to be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. But to the hearts who have become purified through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all is changed. These can know God. Moses was hid in the cleft of the rock when the glory of the Lord was revealed to him. And when it was when it is we when it wow. <laughs> and it is when we are hid in Christ that we behold the love of God. He that hath loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. By faith we shall behold him in here and now. In our daily experience, we discern his goodness and compassion in the manifestation of his providence. We recognize him in the character of his son. The Holy Spirit takes the truth concerning God and him whom he has sent and opens it to the understanding and to the heart. The pure in heart see God in a new and endearing relation, as their redeemer. While they discern the purity and loveliness of his character, they long to reflect his image. They see him as a father longing to embrace a repenting son. 
and their hearts are filled with joy and full of glory. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let's see what the Bible talks about peace. Starting out with Isaiah 9, 6. For us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and, he, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Once Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the originator of peace. It is one of the signifying characteristics of the people who are in his kingdom. In verse 7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Peace is the sign of the people in his kingdom. Don't believe what I say. Believe what the scripture says. So let's take a look at what the scripture says. In Psalms 29 verse 11, it says, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Right there, David says that the Lord will bless his people with peace. Now the next question is, who is God's people? Well, in Jeremiah, it tells us who that is. But this day shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This was not just for Israel. This is the same covenant that is made in the New Testament, spoken by Paul in Hebrews 10, verses 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in, my, in their minds I will write them, so that those who have the law of God written in their hearts and minds are his people. Therefore, they receive the peace from the Prince of Peace. Psalms 37, 37, it says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. The psalmist is saying right here that the result of, the following, the result of following God by living upright is peace. He also goes on to say, the Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. David expands the, this concept of peace further when he says that the peace comes from loving the law. And this is directly tied into the covenant promise that God had given in Jeremiah and Hebrews. In Isaiah 26, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Isaiah says this about peace, that God will keep us in peace when we keep our minds on him, because we trust in him. Isn't trust just another word for faith? So our faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, will give us peace. In Isaiah 32, he clarifies this concept of peace a little further, expanding its scope a little more by identifying the work of righteousness, stating, and the work of righteousness shall be peace. So the working of righteousness is what brings us peace and gives peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now in Romans 10, 15, Paul says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel of peace. That's the key right there. Jesus puts his peace in us as we follow his will until we, in turn, spread it to those around us. This is the effect of the gospel. We will want to share the peace that we have with others. This is how we become the peacemakers. James also adds to the picture in chapter 3, verses 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. So how does one have the fruit of the righteousness? Well, we have no righteousness of ourselves. Because Isaiah says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. We get our righteousness from someone else, and that someone else is God. In Psalms 24, verse 5, he says, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. The psalmist makes it clear right there where our righteousness comes from. In Isaiah 54, 17, it says, 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. If you are just covered by righteousness, you cannot produce righteous acts. Jesus provides a way for us, and it is at the very heart of being saved by grace. It is the focal point of grace. He not only forgives you of your sin, but he gives you a way to resist it. Jesus begins to transform you into his image, and that's the great promise given in grace. Look back at Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 10, 16. Christ's law is his character, and he puts it into our hearts and our minds, making obedience natural for us. He recreates your heart after his. This is how we reap the fruits of righteousness, because Christ keeps the covenant in us. This is righteousness by faith. And, in faith, and by faith alone in Jesus Christ can this happen. The faith in our Lord Jesus Christ that he is the keeper of the covenant, that he is the creator, and that he is the redeemer. Victory is possible on this side of heaven. Jesus has promised it to us if we let, us, let him work the miracle in us.